So, Professor Steve Keane, you have um, uh, come to the UK and are now working at Kingston University. Mm -hmm. I wanted to find out why you made the transition. Kingston is one of the few universities that had a commitment to teaching outside the mainstream of economics as well as teaching the mainstream while also taking an unconventional approach. And I thought this is a chance to build an economics department that actually takes the real world seriously. Well, we're very grateful that you come to London. Thank you. Now, um, getting back to real world economics, mm. uh, you've said that the current economic recovery, both here in the UK and in the US, mm. um, will end much sooner than the last boom. Um, why do you think that is? Well, my analysis, where my analysis differs from conventional economists and quite a few unconventional ones, is that I focus on the role of private debt in generating both demand and income in the economy. Now, because banks lend money and create money by doing that, that spending by you boosts the total demand for the economy. It's not offset by somebody else having to spend less. So therefore, at the aggregate level, total spending is income out of existing money plus gener income generated by new debt, which creates new money. And that's given me a strong focus upon the role of private debt in the economy. And particularly, uh, what this can give you over time is a rising level of private debt compared to income and ultimately get to the stage where that's such a great burden that first of all it stops growing because people don't want to take on any more debt and secondly the, the servicing cost of debt can overwhelm the economy. Now that's what I saw coming uh, back in 2005, that's why I said a financial crisis was coming in the very new, near future. So the last boom in America began in 1993 with a ratio of private debt to America's GDP of roughly 90%. Now, it pretty much doubled by 2007. When it start, stopped growing, the slowdown in that rate of growth is what, what precipitated the financial crisis. Roughly speaking, debt fell from about 180% of GDP to about 160%. People are now getting back, back both, of course, into the stock market, but also into the real estate market. So you're now seeing rising levels of private debt in America again, but it's starting to rise from 160% of GDP. So we'll get a recovery as, as debt continues to rise, but at some point, certainly also if the authorities tighten, put interest rates up and, and pull out QE at the same time, that combination of events could mean the boom comes to end much more rapidly than last time. Now, if you look at the last boom, it started in 93, it finished in 2007, 14 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying I expect something like a, at best half that to be the duration of this boom, if not shorter. So people are worrying about interest rates rising uh, here in the UK, mm. but how likely is it, given the, the problems that it would cause for indebted households? Well, I think it is likely. I still think their policy setting is based on a belief that you know, they simply have to control the inflation rate the, and the unemployment rate using the interest rate. And if they say the unemployment rate falling as it is now, and if they see any sign of inflation rising, they're likely to start putting up rates at the, at the board level in the belief that that will help them find you in the economy. Now, that is going to, from my point of view, increase the servicing cost of the levels of debt people have taken on. If that rate of growth of debt slows down, and it could be slowed down simply by people looking at the interest rate and thinking, ah, uh -uh, it's taken out of my ballpark, I simply can't afford to take on that debt, even though you know, I think I have to buy because prices are rising, that could prick both the house price bubble and it could also prick the rate of growth of mortgage debt. And when that did, that could cause the economy to turn down. So you do think we have a house price bubble in the UK? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when the level of debt is as huge as it is, and a large part of that is mortgage debt. Right. Now, if you have people extending mortgage debt because of this help to sell scheme, driving up the economy because of that increase in debt levels. But as soon as they get tremulous about the dangers of taking on yet more debt and stop taking on more mortgage debt, then there's a huge drop in the level of demand in the economy and it can come down again. Now here in the UK we hear um, about politicians talking about public debt mm. continually really. But very rarely do we um, hear them focusing on, on private debt. Mm. And I wanted to, to ask you why that is. The vast majority of politicians believe the uh, myth about money creation that you learn if you do a first year economics course, which they call the money multiplier model. And that pretty much says that the, the government gives, say, you know, a, a, gives a, a welfare check of £100. 
the welfare recipient goes to the bank and deposits that money. Before the welfare recipient does it, the bank is at its limit, so it can't lend any money. Then it gets a hundred pounds and it hangs on to ten pounds and lends out ninety. Right. And then ultimately you get a thousand pounds created out of that process. But that implies the government's in control of the creation of money. Now that is not at all the mechanics of money creation and the Bank of England has come out and said that an excellent publication saying that money is created simply by banks creating a loan and creating a matching deposit. And they also have this knee-jerk attitude and it applies both to Labor and Conservative. They both believe that the private sector is responsible for what it, was, what it does and the government tends to be irresponsible. And therefore they both focus on getting the level of government debt down, completely ignoring what's happening in private debt. Now my way of thinking is Virtually everything about that perspective is wrong. Right. For a start, the government's not like a household. And frankly, if it were, it'd have a lot more debt, ironically, because private debt in America, for example, is about twice the level of government debt now. And before the crisis began, private debt was four times the level of government debt. Banks make profit by creating debt. But when you buy an asset like a share or a property, you believe that that asset's going to continue increasing in price and increase faster than consumer prices, faster than your income. So you're willing to take on more and more and leave your position because you think you'll get a gain out of it. So all this means that it's very easy to persuade people to get into mortgage debt or margin debt when you can't persuade them to get into credit card debt. And I think we have to change the nature of, of, of debt for buying assets so it's more like credit card debt which is related to your income in your mind as well as in how much the bank will let you take on. So can you give me an example of how that would work, let's say for example with um, houses? Well, let's say you and I are competing over uh, the same property. Yes. We both have the same income. Okay. And we both save the amount of same amount of money. In the current situation, the winner would be the one who got a high level of leverage from the bank. If the bank was also subject to a rule that would have to be imposed upon them, they'd never do it themselves, that the maximum loan they could lend would be some multiple of the income earning capacity of the house being purchased. First of all, the price would be lower, but secondly, if it compete each other, one of us would need to save more than the other because we couldn't win out of leverage. Much of the, your, the, the um, reforms that you recommend are predicated upon reform of the banking sector, mm. cutting the finance sector down to size. But how realistic is that given the, the sort of nexus between um, the political class um, and banks. I mean, a lot of the mm. MPs receive money from banks, um, even government ministers, and then they go on to work for the banks after mm. being in government. Um, is it realistic to think that this reform is going to be come about in our lifetime? No, <laughs> frankly. I think it'll take a political shift before it does. You're quite right. I've actually coined the expression the politico-financial complex. So we have to break that political nexus. It's false, because the reality is finance is a cost of doing business. It's not a profit center. Finance, of course, has to make a profit in its own right to be viable. You need a financially successful, profitable banking sector, but you don't need one that's 30 and 40% of the profits of the economy, because at that level, it's actually siphoning off money being generated in real production by the industrial sector and the agricultural sector and the mineral sectors. Ultimately, you, you know, the financial sector should be a servant of the rest of the economy, not the master. But at the moment, it's the master not just of the economy, but of the politicians as well. So to break the next issue, they need a complete political shift. And I think that's only going to happen probably over 10 to 15, maybe 20 years, when this the, the gap between the old and the young that's built out of this system now, where the old have got enormous wealth generated by finance, and where the poor can't afford, the young are, become, are becoming, you know, unless they've got rich parents, poor courtesy of the cost of getting into housing. And that political shift could mean ultimately they vote against all the props that help keep this political financial complex going. But you need a serious political shift, and it certainly isn't going to happen in the next 10 years. Not even with the possibility of a a recession in that a second, A second one could do, could make it possible to bring it back in because certainly the, the, the last crisis took the, into the, the, the political system and the financials by surprise. The next one will too, to some extent. So we could walk into the next one relatively blindfolded. Where did it come from? Then there's a chance to put through those serious reforms that only during a crisis do you get a chance to make serious change. 
if the crisis has been survived or even just attenuated, that's enough for conventional thought to come back in again, as has happened this time round.